Well, hi everyone. Uh, Ken Ham here from Answers in Genesis, along with Dr. Nathaniel Jensen. And Dr. Jensen has a PhD in biology from Harvard University, and he's been doing a lot of research on genetics and human populations. We've been doing this series. This is number six, actually, in the series. But it's a series on the new history of the human race, and we're much more closely related than we think. And Dr. Nathaniel Jensen is rewriting human history. Now, interesting thing is he's not rewriting the Bible. He's rewriting secular history and giving us a whole different look at history. It's absolutely fascinating. He actually is able to look at genetics and you can actually there work out some time clocks and look at signatures that uh, actually reflect certain events in history. And actually it shows the evolutionary history is just wrong just plain straight wrong and what he's finding he actually confirms what the bible has said all along so uh, we just did episode five and episode five was about mitochondrial dna and looking at uh, signatures in the mitochondrial dna that actually point back to three groups that correspond we would say to the wives of uh, ham sham and japheth and episode six the smoking gun of human history uh, so, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, take it away as you talk about the Y chromosome, the male, and you've got a fascinating uh, insight here in regard to a signature for an event in history that the Bible talks about and that we actually exhibit in Northern Kentucky. Is that right? Yes, we're going to look at another echo of the flood, this time looking at the, the male DNA. And we're gonna take it a step further. Last time we looked at the, the female inherited DNA and saw that we could get a big picture confirmation of 6,000 years of history. We can see the, a, a hint of the flood. And we, we stopped short of being able to dig into the details of post Babel history because of certain technical problems we have with mitochondrial DNA. We wanna take that a step further this time and see a smoking gun that basically blows all evolutionary objections to what we're discussing out of the water and now and then sets the path forward for digging deeply into who we came from who we are and it's going to set the path for all our discussions going forward and this week just like uh yesterday i should say today just like yesterday we're going to see once again it gets a little bit technical but this is going to be as technical as it gets everything going forward from here is going to be basically look who these people are, look at the dates of when they split, and we're gonna avoid all the technical complex genetics. But this is foundational for everything we're gonna say going forward, and it, it really is the key to engaging the evolutionary side. And I might, might just add, Dr. Jensen, that if somebody doesn't understand the genetics, and it's, it's really not that super technical, but that doesn't matter, just look at the big picture of what you're saying, because you'll get it, you'll understand it. Exactly. And even if we go into the weeds a little bit, we'll always come back up for error. So if you didn't understand every single point, you'll still get the big picture of, okay, yes, I see where this is going. And you'll know exactly what you need to know going forward to understand the, the big questions that we're getting out of, of who we came from, who we are, how living people are connected, how we connect back to the ancient civilizations, the Greeks, the Romans, the Assyrians, all these sorts of people to understand whether or not some of us sitting in America have links going back to the ancient times and to ancient civilizations that we've learned about, but perhaps never became personal. And I've, I've learned in doing this research just in the last few years that what I've taken for granted is, is wrong. And even the things you learn in standard history class are not what we think they are because most history is taught from a political perspective. And the only way you can teach it from a people's perspective is with genetics and we haven't had those tools until recently. And as we saw in our last episode, those tools we do have are dominated by mainstream science and they're missing the key to human history, which is the 6,000 year time scale. They do not want that to be true. They refuse to examine our genetic history through that lens. And so they're missing massive amounts of what's going on. And just to recap very briefly what we've seen in the previous episodes, we've looked at human population history, seeing that going back just a few hundred years, there's 20 times fewer people alive back then than are alive today. And so this forces us when we're looking for spouses to, to look beyond our own group or to look to people who are closer relatives than we might be comfortable with today. So this, this affects how closely or distantly related we are. We've seen that our family trees are much more connected than we think. We reached that conclusion 
by going backwards through our each of our family trees and seeing that every generation the number of ancestors multiplies i come from two parents who they each come from two parents and two four eight sixteen thirty two it multiplies very quickly and so go back just to 800 a thousand years and theoretically we have two billion ancestors that can't possibly be true because there weren't that many people alive so our family trees must connect our parents must be more related to each other than we think and maybe are comfortable with if you apply that globally, you see that racial, so-called racial or ethnic change must happen more quickly than we think. We looked at the genetics behind this and saw how easy this is. We've seen that if you apply that with just slight differences in reproductive rates over a few hundred years, you can get massive ethnic change. It's theoretically possible that most of Europe has recent African ancestry, even though they look Caucasian. And the only way we can know whether or not that's true is to look at the genetics. We saw last time with mitochondrial DNA that our family tree is much more shallow than we think. Even if you've watched this and you're saying, I'm a young earth creationist, I've believed for a long time that the earth is only 6,000 years old. Once you translate that to the number of human generations, which is 200 or less, suddenly it starts to hit you. Okay, there's 8 billion people. We have to reduce that back to eight. There's 8 billion branches in our family tree close to it now to reduce that back to eight in just 200 steps wow you have to start connecting branches very quickly what we're going to see this time is the smoking gun of human history and again because it it can tend towards something technical i'm going to review what we've covered because the y chromosome has many points that parallel the mitochondrial dna so we're just going to basically see that the many similar points to last time but with a few different nouns and instead of maternal history it'll be paternal history instead of looking through mom's line we're going to look through dad's line and once again the the problem we're trying to solve the scientific problem we're trying to solve is why don't these popular genetic tests tell you more about your own history we've seen that the the, the problem they run into comes from biology if you're like me and most of your family tree is caucasians and you wonder if you have perhaps a dark skin ancestor or if the roles are reversed, you're someone perhaps of African-American or African descent, and most of your family tree is dark-skinned peoples, and you want to know if you have a light-skinned ancestor, you, you run into the same mathematical biological problem. That ancestor, in theory, is going to be 100% that ethnicity, in this case, in this diagram, 100% African. But if he marries a light-skinned individual, their children at most are going to be 50% African at the genetic level. The next generation, 25%, then 12, 12.5%, then six and a quarter percent. That number drops by half every generation. And we discussed the fact that below 10%, if you, if you take the $100 test from one of these popular companies, below 10% is probably not reliable for technical reasons that we discussed briefly. So what can we do to go back beyond four or five generations to, to deeper history? So in a, in a short diagram, the, the problem can be encapsulated like this. You've got these two broad bands, two streams of genetic information coming from each parent that have to be reduced into you and me, and, and that's the problem, the reduction of genetic information each generation. We saw that for mitochondrial DNA, there is a biological, a cell biology basis for looking elsewhere. We saw that, let's say this is an egg cell, there's two places where you can find DNA. That large sphere in the middle is the nucleus, those smaller oval compartments, the four of them shown there are the mitochondria. They also have DNA, both the sphere and the mitochondria, the nucleus and the mitochondria have DNA. The sperm also has two repositories of DNA. The more common and well-known one is the purple, the nucleus, but it also has mitochondria shown there, those, that spiral shaped goldish structure. When sperm and egg meet, most of what we talk about, 99% of our DNA is the nuclear DNA, the sphere in the egg and then that purple nucleus in the sperm. When, sper when sperm enters egg, it's not the entire sperm structure, it's just the head that has the nucleus. And so most people and, and the majority of the information you're getting from one of these $100 commercial genetic tests deals with this type of DNA. The problem is that signal gets diluted. Well, the mitochondrial DNA comes from mom, only, and then we, said, we saw that the reason for this at a biological level, at the, at the level of fertilization, is because, again, only the sperm head enters, the tail that has the mitochondria does not. And this represents less than 1% of our DNA. So we saw that this solves this biparental dilution problem. It only comes through mom. It's just the stream through mom. 
so you don't have the dad diluting the signal every generation. So that is one way to solve this problem. And we saw that it's not necessarily 100% identical transmission every generation. What happens every so often is that as mom copies that mitochondrial DNA, the egg is, is inheriting this mitochondrial DNA, that the, the copying process is imperfect. We live in a fallen world. The curse has happened. The perfect creation God intended has been corrupted by sin and by the curse. And so mistakes happen. And one of the indirect benefits of this for our purposes and for studying history is that because the process of transmission is imperfect, we do not all have identical mitochondrial DNA. There are differences, and those differences act like a clock. And so the, the more differences that exist between any two people, the deeper in history you have to go to find the common ancestor. The fewer the differences between any two people, the more shallow, the more recent their connection. So you can use this fact to reconstruct a family tree of the globe. And we saw that taking all this information together, these genetic studies indicate mitochondrial Eve lived just 6,000 years ago. And again, if you convert this to the number of generations, 6,000 years, the number of generations, we worked through the math last time and found this is just less than 200 generations ago, just a few short steps. The problem we said though, to, to drill down into more detail, to more precision, we get the big picture with this, but to go precise, the, the, the ticking of the clock is still very slow, even by young earth standard. That's once every five to 10 generations. That means once every several hundred years. So that's not very great resolution if you're looking at details of history, especially if you wanna know something within the last 200 years, you really can't see it. Plus there's the statistical noise, that's a technical point. The main conclusion is we're, we're stuck then. We know that mitochondrial DNA indicates a 6,000 year history, but if we wanna get at the specific details beyond, yes, there's creation, yes, there's flood, and, and maybe there's a Babel event, we can't get much further. Well, where else can we look? Let's go back to the cell biology of fertilization and look at a, a different angle. So we saw that with mitochondrial DNA, it's, it's inherited only through one parent because of what happens to the sperm cell. It does not pass on its mitochondrial DNA as best as we know, because the, the structure in which the mitochondrial DNA exists stays outside the egg. Well, what we're gonna look at now is something that happens in the nucleus, and it's a, it's a detail of the inheritance of the nuclear DNA that leads to male-only inherited DNA. What am I talking about? Well, let's dig deeper now into what would exist in the sphere of the egg, in the, in the purple nucleus of the, of the sperm. If you were to crack open a cell in your body, or if you were able to watch with a microscopic camera what is occurring in the nuclei of these two cells after they fuse, you were to open up and look at the DNA sort of as a, as a magnified microscopic but still big picture view of the DNA, you'd find something like this. These are chromosomes. This is an actual image of human DNA. So there's six billion letters of DNA that exist in our cells, and here they are. It's, again, sort of at a, at, at a cellular level sort of zoomed out because you don't actually see six billion letters literally, but you see them broken up into chunks. They look kind of like wet noodles, and those wet noodles are what we call chromosomes. And you'll notice that for every certain sized chromosome, there's a, there's a matching pair. So over here, you have a, relatively speaking, long wet noodle or chromosome, it's matched up to a fairly similar sized one here. If you go down to the bottom of the screen, there's a short chromosome on the left, it's matched up to a short chromosome on the right. And the reason they exist in these pairs is because one member of each pair comes from mom, shown here in magenta, and the other one comes from dad, shown here in blue. So that's the cell biology basis for why our DNA comes from both parents and, and how it's set up. Well, why am I bringing this up? You'll notice that there's one pair down the lower right of the screen that I've not added a two columns to. And you'll notice if we zoom in here, it's mismatched. The other chromosomes are numbered one through 23. There's 23 pairs, or actually one through 22. This is the 23rd pair. And they're just given those numbers. Those are called autosomes. What we're looking at here are the sex chromosomes because they determine gender. Females are XX. They have an X chromosome that's matched up with a similar sized one. Males are XY. The Y chromosome is much shorter here than the X, chrom than the X chromosome, and it looks like a mismatch. This is what determines maleness. 
This is what you see if you were to crack open cells in my body and the bodies of my sons. And this difference then is what makes the Y chromosome unique to males. So instead of both males and females having mitochondrial DNA, but sperm kind of leaving it out, in this case, only males have Y chromosomes, females do not have it. And so if you were to look at this family tree, my Y chromosome comes only through the paternal line because only dads have it, only dads pass it on. This now, to summarize everything we've just discussed, gives us yet another tool by which to dig deeper in history. And the reason is females do not dilute the signal. The way they do not dilute it is they just don't have a Y chromosome. They can't add a second one to, to dilute the ethnic signal. Only dads pass it on. And so it's a record of male history. It happens to represent 1% of the male DNA. It's about 60 uh, million letters long. So here's our first key takeaway. And it parallels what we saw in our last episode for mitochondrial DNA. Here's the corresponding genetic compartment for men. The Y chromosome comes through dad's lineage. And so this problem of diluting by half, diluting by half, diluting by half doesn't exist for the Y chromosome because the females aren't contributing. And again, this diagram shows you that my male DNA comes just through the, the right side here. It doesn't tell you about the rest of the family tree. So there's some information it does not record. But for our purposes, we want to we wanna get more time depth. We want to go back deeper in history, and this is what allows us to do it. And just like for mitochondrial DNA, if, if the Y chromosome was passed on perfectly, all the Y chromosomes of all the men around the globe would look identical. They don't. And the reason they don't is because, once again, we live in a fallen world, and the same principle for mitochondrial DNA applies here. The Y chromosome, when it's copied in sperm, passed on to sperm, happens imperfectly. We live in a, a cursed, fallen creation. There's mistakes that occur. And so this is a more accurate representation of what's going on. It gets passed on imperfectly. The Y chromosome, just like mitochondrial DNA, acts like a clock. There are ticks that occur. And so just like for mitochondrial DNA, you can compare Y chromosomes around the globe. If me and some other man have very few Y chromosome differences between us, that means we had a recent male ancestor. If you com compare me to, let's say, Ken Ham, and we have many, excuse me, many Y chromosome differences between us, that means we had a, a male ancestor in the distant past. So in that sense, it acts like a clock. So there's, there's again, these points are virtually identical to the mitochondrial DNA. I'm just exchanging the word mitochondrial DNA for Y chromosome. And again, it's a record of the dad side instead of mom side. So if the Y chromosome acts like a clock, perhaps we can take it back deep in history to the beginning. And the principle, again, to apply what we discussed in episode two is the principle of how our family tree expands. I come from two parents. We each come from two parents. And, and on back it goes. It keeps multiplying. You basically divide these numbers by half for the male side. The point is you can't go back indefinitely to the beginning where you keep multiplying the number of your ancestors. It, it, the numbers become too great to be realistic. At some point, you have to start connecting these branches on the family tree. So this, again, applies to the, not just the female side, but also the male side. And we discuss this in the context of going back a few hundred of thousand years. I'm saying now that this principle applies even if you go all the way back to the beginning. The number of people alive in the globe keeps getting smaller and smaller the deeper you go into history, which means you have to keep connecting these branches to one another until eventually you reach the beginning. And so that beginning, that first paternal ancestor, is something we want to now explore in more depth. The evolutionists call this guy the Y chromosome Adam. And once again, just like the mitochondrial Eve sounds like, hmm, wonder if she could be the biblical Eve, the use of the term Adam by the mainstream community tempts many people to say, could this be the biblical Adam? And many old earth creationists have gone that direction. Now, the same problems we saw for mitochondrial Eve apply to Y chromosome Adam. Here's a tree that we're going to look at in more detail in, in future episodes. And I'm not going to take the time to derive the problems with Y chromosome Adam. This is the name of the paper from which it comes. Because the, the principles, the, the applications are basically identical to the problems with mitochondrial Eve. When you, do, when you reconstruct, based on Y chromosome DNA, a family tree for the globe, the evolutionists say, well, the beginning of our family tree, and so in this case, once again, the, uh, the family tree time moves from left to right instead of from top to bottom. 
if we were to zoom in here, you'd see that it was anchored. And, and if, we, if, if we look deeper in the evolutionary literature, they anchor it based on where the chimpanzee branches off. So their idea of where the beginning is, where Adam is, assumes he has common ancestry with apes. Again, they, the Africans branch off first, so they say he lived in Africa, not in the Middle East, not near uh, Mount Ararat. They also say that even though we go back to one man, one Y chromosome Adam, he was part of a larger population of humans. They deny the existence of a first pair. They always say it's a population. They explicitly reject the biblical account of God creating just two people in the beginning who are the ancestors of all of us. And of course, they stretch out this family tree over 200,000 years. Dr. Jensen, um, let me just summarize here a little bit as we're going on. So yeah. um, people aren't getting confused or anything, but, um, and, then, and tell me if I have it right, okay? Yeah. So number one, when people say, how could you get all the world's population just from eight people on the flood and then going back to just two people from Adam and Eve, uh, population uh, dynamics, when you look at what happens, I mean, population growth happens very quickly and exponentially, and you can easily account for that. That, <clears throat> that was, you established that early on in the series. And yes. so what you're saying is if you work backwards, obviously, you know, what that really means is you, you can't having, have more and more people, it, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't fit with, you know, the number of population we have today and in the time scales, it just doesn't fit. So therefore, you have to be in the past more closely related than what we think. And so smaller populations, so people are much more closely related. And so all those changes that we've seen happen for distinguishing groups around uh, the globe have happened very, very quickly, uh, not, not slowly. And then yes. you, using mitochondrial Eve, uh, using mitochondrial DNA, uh, what, what you're showing is when you look at mutations and use that as a clock, uh, the further back you go, you realize with the number of mutations today and they, you get less and less and it, it points to about, 6,000 years ago uh, for the beginning of the human race. It doesn't point to hundreds of thousands of years ago. And then the same now with the Y chromosome, it's pointing to the same sort of thing. And yes. uh, even, even more than that, you were able to, in the mitochondrial DNA, look at uh, three groupings to start with. They corresponded to Shem, Ham, and Japheth's wives. And uh, now you're going to be using the Y chromosome to point to a signature and, and the history as, as well. So have I got that right so far? Summarized it okay? Exactly. Yes. Yes, exactly. So all those are true. And we're, we're trying to derive if, if we can drill down now as the next step in light of all that, can we drill down and look at the details of post-flood, post-Babel human history? Can we see the echo of that? And we've seen that if, if we just apply the concept that Y chromosome comes through dad, it acts like a clock, but then without any consideration from what the mainstream community is saying, we say, oh, Y chromosome Adam that they talk about must be the biblical one. We say that that can't possibly be true. Let's look through the biblical lens. And I wanna focus specifically here now uh, on what they say about the time scale, because this is something we can test scientifically. In our last episode, we said the, the mitochondrial time scale is not derived directly from genetics. They take it from evolutionary geology apply it directly and, and stretch the, the family tree of humanity over that time scale and assume that it must be 200,000 years. They do the same thing for the Y chromosome family tree. They say, here's all these differences. We know from geology, archaeology, it must take a long time. So we're going to stretch out this whole tree, plant it in Africa, assume common ancestry. That's how they do it. Well, the way you test whether or not this matches up with reality in a scientific sense is you get fathers and sons and you directly count how many mistakes are made every generation. And this story is even more wild than the story we examined for mitochondrial DNA. Truth is stranger than fiction. Again, the principle is there's mistakes that occur. Well, what, every generation, every few generations? No one knows until you directly measure it by getting dad's Y chromosome, son's Y chromosome, grandpa's Y chromosome, grandson's Y chromosome, so the story and, and the way this is played out for the Y chromosome, these sorts of studies were performed beginning in 2009. There was an initial study in 2009, then another one in 2015. They were based on low quality data, low quality DNA, but the results that they concluded, the 
rate of errors, the rate of mutations that they empirically discovered was slow and it fit their expectations for 200,000 years. And when I initially saw these papers, I wasn't quite sure what to do with them. Well, you wait and two subsequent studies were done, also one in 2015, one in 2017, based on high quality DNA and what they discovered and what they did with it is again, stuff you can't make up. It's the same paper that I showed earlier dealing with and, and showing the global family tree of humanity. Their global family tree of humanity has, I think, accurate branches. But what they included as part of their study was a, a, a set of father-son pairs as a check on their work to make sure what they were doing was accurate. And if you look at the main text of the paper, they say we found a rate that's consistent with evolution. If you look at the supplemental information where they actually tell you the details of how they arrived at that conclusion, it gets really wild. So here's a direct quote from their paper. They said, again, looking at these father-son comparisons where they were trying to check their experiments to make sure they were working, they said the number of father-son Y chromosome differences, mutations, was approximately tenfold higher than the expected number, considering the range of published Y chromosome mutation or copying mistake rates. And if you look at what they're referring to about the published rates, they're talking about the previous low quality attempts that gave results consistent with evolution. In other words, they said, we discovered something unexpected. When we used high quality DNA, we discovered a rate that was much higher than what evolution predicts. And here's what I've highlighted in red. This finding prompted us to explore additional filters. What they literally did was filter out data that contradicted the expectations of evolution. They took their high quality DNA that gave results that I'll show you in a minute were consistent with the Bible. They said, even though this is high quality DNA, it's better data, it doesn't fit evolution, therefore we've got to filter out stuff that doesn't fit. You can't make this stuff up. These are smart people, but they're bound by the framework of evolution and the bottom line is both of these subsequent studies fit exactly the biblical expectations. And I put so, here 4,500 years ago. So Dr. Jensen, how, much, how often does that happen with a lot of other research that's being done? My impression is when you're dealing with science in which the worldview component is minor, when we're dealing with questions of the present, does this particular drug cure cancer? Or here's a very relevant one. Does this particular drug uh, cure the coronavirus. These are questions of the present that don't really require you to make some statement about the past. And so by and large, those sorts of results are done rationally. They're done with an eye to the data. They're done rigorously to say, does the data fit expectations? Does it actually cure patients? Should we give them true hope? Is it false hope? That sort of, di that sort of discussion tends to be reliable. Of course, if it's coming out of communist China, where we already have evidence that things are being suppressed, another story. I'm talking about Western science. However, anytime you touch on the question of origins, what you see time and time again is the conclusions must match the evolutionary framework. For some reason, all this sort of rationality gets thrown to the curb and the data is forced to conform and, and fit the, the preconceived notions. Again, you, you can't make this up. You say, and, and I've worked with people here. I, I know personally evolutionists and I know they're smart people. And you say, why are you doing this? Why? This is obviously not something that's rational. Why are you forcing the better data to fit the bad data solely for the purpose of confirming evolution? And, and it is what well, we know as Christians why this is occurring. But again, I, you, you can't make this up. This is literally what you can find documented in their own papers. Yeah, it's, a, it's an ir irrational prejudice because of the heart of man. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. You can't ignore the spiritual state of things. So when you say 4,500 years ago here, I mean, that's about the time of the flood, isn't it? Exactly. And so if we, if we say, okay, we've now got this father-son rate, what should we expect in light of the Bible? Well, we're thinking about male inheritance, and the Bible is explicit and clear on what the male state was at the time of the flood. Noah has three boys. And again, the, the key verse here is Genesis chapter 9, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And from these, the whole earth was populated. So there's not some other... Uh, group that survived outside the flood. You can, you can look back in the early 1800s, and we'll discuss this more in subsequent episodes, where they're talking about, uh, well, maybe there was a local flood, and, and maybe the Native Americans came from some people who survived the flood. There are people who, who call themselves creationists back then, and are invoking these sorts of hypotheses. Genesis 9 says, sorry, that doesn't work. Everyone was destroyed. The world was wicked. From only these three, the earth was repopulated. 
And so then thinking about this from a biological Y chromosome perspective, these guys are males. They have Y chromosomes. Who do they get their Y chromosomes from? Well, it's male inherited. They get it from Noah. And so we, the, the men alive today, all have traced their ancestry back to one man, Noah. And we wouldn't necessarily expect the exact same structure in the Y chromosome that we would for mitochondrial DNA. We've got mitochondrial DNA through the three wives. And those three wives are not necessarily sisters. They might have several differences between them. Well, these three boys are brothers. And so their Y chromosome coming directly from Noah is going to be very similar to it. And it may actually be kind of hard to find a three-pronged structure. It depends on how fast or slow Y chromosome changes occur. It so happens that the, the Y chromosome rate of copying errors, of mutations that we can see today, is about two or so every generation. So there might be a structure, a structure in the Y chromosome tree that shows the beginning point and then three very tiny branches coming out from it. There is still some statistical noise in the Y chromosome, so I can't say yet with certainty whether or not there's such a three-pronged structure, but there is clearly a beginning. And the more immediate application is, from a biblical perspective, it's more appropriate to talk about the Y chromosome Noah, not the Y chromosome Adam, because unlike the three ladies who might not have a common ancestor back to Eve, we know these three boys' most recent common ancestor is Noah. And you really can't go back beyond Noah unless you have some sort of DNA from the pre-flood people, which I don't think we do. And the bottom line, again, the key takeaway here is just like for mitochondrial DNA, the Y chromosome Noah, the most recent common ancestor, lived just 4,500 years ago. And in fact, you can be fairly precise with this, 4,500 years instead of 6,000 years. It fits very well. And, and, and another practical takeaway from this is that our male ancestry goes back, if it's 4,500 years, less than 200 generations ago. Four billion men collapsed back to four and then back to Noah in less than 200 generations. So all those branches of our family tree must collapse that quickly. Now, I still haven't gotten to the smoking gun of human history, and let me set it up this way. So once again, our family tree is shorter, more shallow than we think. We've discussed some of the limitations of mitochondrial DNA, that mtDNA abbreviation there. It, it doesn't tick very fast, even from a young Earth perspective, there's a lot of statistical noise. Well, for the Y chromosome, the clock ticks every single generation. So in theory, I can walk back through every single one of those 200 or less generations to the beginning. I can see every generation of history in this Y chromosome family tree. That is remarkable. And what's even better is there is low statistical noise. So if I get my Y chromosome sequence, I compare it to Ken Ham's. We find that, let's say we had a common ancestor, common male ancestor in the year 1000 AD we can be fairly certain it's right around there. It might be 900 to 1100 AD, but we can be pretty precise with this sort of data, which means we can make some very specific conclusions and inferences from the history of humanity from this Y chromosome. Now, what's the smoking gun? I'm gonna derive it in three steps using something that most people probably haven't thought about, but if you think about it briefly, it's, it's fairly self-evident. So let me derive the first step this way. Let's think of a theoretical family tree, and let's think of males. Let's say there's a, a, a dad or a grandfather who marries, and he has two boys. Here's his family tree. And let's say we've got someone who has developed the ability to live over many generations and can watch this whole sequence of events in real time and write down, okay, there was one dad, and then he had two boys, and he, you know, they grew up. And they each have two boys, and he's writing down, okay, every generation, now there's four people in this generation, and they grow up and have two boys. Now there's, now there's eight, and then there's 16, and, then there's, and, and on and on you go. He documents historically the number of people, the number of boys at every generation. You could then graph that out. What I want to show you, though, is if, if you look simply at their family tree, which I've shown here, and you count the number of branches at each generation. There's one branch at this generation, and then here there's two branches, then you go next generation, there's four branches. You also get the sense for how many people are alive, how many men are alive at each generation. And you might say, well, that's kind of a kindergarten point. You know, if, if I graph out my own family tree, it's me and then the three branches coming out for me. Well, it is a kindergarten point, but it's a profound point. The branches of a family tree reflect population size. Well, I've given a little local example. 
This applies around the globe. If we were to create the family tree of the globe, the number of branches at any particular point in that family tree should reflect the global population size. Here, what I've shown is population doubling. If some other scenario played out, let's say there was a dad who had just one son, maybe a bunch of daughters, just one boy and then another son. And, and for several generations, there's only one son who's born. And then eventually that population starts doubling again. This, this dad has two sons and his boys grew up and they each have two sons and on it goes. Again, the number of branches in the family tree would reflect the male population size. It'd be flat for a while because there's no population growth and then it starts shooting up. So this kindergarten point is profound. The number of branches in a family tree records changes in population size. Well, we've said that the fact that DNA mistakes occur, and we've just observed that they occur every generation in the Y chromosome, means we can reconstruct a global family tree for humanity. And we'll dig into this more in, in subsequent episodes. So DNA is a record of the global family tree. So let's take these two points and combine them. DNA is a record of the global family tree, but family trees, global family trees, record changes in global population sizes. Therefore, the global family tree is a record of the global change in population size. So we're almost there to the smoking gun. Here's why I'm calling a smoking gun. You might recall from episode one, a graph like this, which shows the hockey stick shape of human population growth. This is a little ironic because that hockey stick shape, of course, is a subject of intense controversy when it comes to climate change and global warming. So the fact that human population history also has a hockey stick shape should be something the mainstream scientists do not deny. And in fact, they agree on this. Young Earth creationists and evolutionists agree that from about 1000 BC onward to the present, there's little disagreement about what this is. It's inferred from archeology, span it's inferred from historical records like the censuses of the, of the Chinese empires, of the Roman empires and so forth. Now I'm gonna redraw this because this is now a way to test whether or not the human family tree is a record of long period of time or of a short period of time. Think about it, 3000 years from 1000 BC until now, represents the vast majority of post-flood history. 3,000 years is a big chunk of 4,500. From the evolutionary perspective, the last 3,000 years represents just a tiny fraction of the hundreds of thousands of years of human history. So they don't even bother really looking for this in the Y chromosome because it's gonna be virtually undetectable, just at the very tip, they think, at the, of, of the human family tree. Well, this sort of history should be stamped all throughout the Y chromosome tree, if indeed it is young. So let me, let me redraw this so that we can see the, the smoking gun with our own eyes. I've drawn two dotted lines now because inferring past population size from archeology span and, and written records, it has some estimation involved. And so there's a range of estimates and those dotted lines give you the range of estimates for the global population size. And I've stopped at around 1800-ish or so. And so you can see I've also depicted it in terms of male. So there's 100 million males in maybe around 300 AD. I've put the BC years in terms of negative numbers. So you can see BC, AD. You can see about uh, around 1800 AD. If you go up here, there's maybe 400 million men alive. This is now the inference from archaeology and from written history. Well, let's go to the global human family tree. I'm taking the tree from the evolutionary literature, but I'm putting a different starting point on it. And we can actually test a variety of different starting points. The point is, I'm not assuming we have a common ancestor with a chimpanzee. What happens then if you just count the number of branches at any particular point in history? What does the Y chromosome history look like? So I'm gonna I'm gonna use the same x-axis, the same time scale here from 2700 BC up to the basically about 1800. And this is the y-axis then for the Y chromosome, the number of branches. Well, what if you superimpose these two? You get a hockey stick shape. This should not be true if our global human family tree is hundreds of thousands of years old. How are the evolutionists gonna explain this? This is a smoking gun and it's a really remarkable discovery because of the history of the creation evolution debate. For many years, creationists have spent time and, and valid, useful time pointing out the flaws in evolution. This completely turns the tables because it's not saying here's the problem with evolution. It's turning around and saying, look, we've made a prediction, a scientific prediction, 
and boom, here's the smoking gun. We see the hockey stick shape stamped all throughout the global family tree. This shouldn't be here if the world is hundreds of thousands of years old. It should be here if it's just a few thousand years old. If we go back to Noah just 4,500 years ago, this is exactly what you would find. This is a positive evidence for creation and it puts the evolutionists on the defensive. And what we are seeing and will see is roles reversed. What's gonna happen in the debate going forward is not so much creationists pointing out flaws in evolution. Creationists are now in the driver's seat saying, we're doing science we can, and, and we're gonna do science more and more throughout the subsequent episodes, looking at what this means for human history. We're gonna see this reflected here in the global level and also at local regional levels. The evolutionists are gonna to have to then start trying to nitpick and find flaws in creation because it's working so well. This is a remarkable discovery. This is the smoking gun. And I've published this now. These are papers that just came out in December. You can see that smoking gun there. So this, again, this is information you will find only here with us. This is new research. And the global Y chromosome tree is the key to human history. And I'm not a poet, but if you want some sort of rhyming way, the global, human, the global Y chromosome tree is the key to human history. That is the phrase we will apply over and over again in subsequent episodes. And we're going to see all that we've discussed played out here, that, that it's more shallow than we think. We're going to see these, these crazy theoretical calculations about taking over a country played out in this Y chromosome family tree. We're going to see ethnic changes that we think couldn't possibly happen, but are genetically plausible and in, in ways we didn't think post Babel didn't expect. We're going to see how many connections exist. And again, the smoking gun we've just seen is a reflection of the history of human population growth. So this is just the beginning. Now you know why we're gonna focus on the Y chromosome family tree. There will be at some point, if, if you've done a genetic test and you maybe you've done your Y chromosome and they've told you you're as part of this group or that group, we might be able to tell you and, and give some inferences into what that history means. Again, you're not gonna get this through a commercial genetic testing company. This is only through us. This is the new history of the human race and we've just begun this. So, um... Dr. Jensen, that paper again, I just uh, refer people to that, uh, if you could share that again yeah. uh, up on the screen. Uh, ANSWERS Research Journal is free and it's our technical research journal and it actually is uh, edited by Dr. Andrew Snelling and of course peer reviewed. And you can see here ANSWERS Research Journal number 12, uh, evidence for a human Y chromosome molecular clock you can read the paper that Dr. Jensen has published there. So you can just do a search on, on the internet for Answers Research Journal or go to our website, answersingenesis.org, and you can go through to the uh, Answers Research Journal from there. You'll see it in the, the menus there and uh, you can search for it. But that is a free uh, journal and lots and lots of research papers in there, by the way, that I encourage people to read. Now, this is part six. So part seven and eight, we're gonna have a little a uh, break over Easter because we have other programs we're doing. We have a special Easter program. People go to our website, they can see that. Uh, we have some special programs on Good Friday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, even a special program for kids by uh, Brian Osborne on the Saturday, I believe. And I'll, I'll have Ray Comfort do a devotion and we'll be doing some other things over Easter. Then after Easter, the following weekend, it'll be part seven and eight. What are we gonna be looking at in part seven and eight? Part seven, we'll be looking at the lost relatives of Europe. So it'll be our first step. We're gonna, we're gonna walk through slowly and carefully this Y chromosome family tree that is, again, just a, a few thousand years old. It can, in theory, give us information of every generation. And we're gonna begin at one section that has blown my mind and, and really challenged me for some time, but it's, it's got some crazy implications for who Europeans are related to in the recent past. I won't give it away yet who it is. You'll have to tune in. And then we'll also, in, in the, in the following episode, uh, apply some of that a little bit further. And uh, what I'm currently titling it is how many Europeans are of Mongol descent and don't know it. So these are the, these are the beginnings of what we're going to do now, looking at history of Europe. Wow, that is, uh, that is really fascinating. Now, if people want to go through and, and relook at, or if they haven't even seen them, the first six episodes now, they can go to Answers YouTube channel, and there's a playlist there on the Answers YouTube channel and that playlist will uh, have them all there and you can go through and maybe if you have seen them go through and look at them all again because there's so much information in these and so much that uh, just challenges uh, our thinking so 
Uh, we're really looking forward to that, uh, Dr. Jensen. So we'll see you back here on the weekend after Easter for part seven and part eight, uh, where you're rewriting human history and rewriting it using real science, genetics, but showing that it confirms when you use observational science, real science, and use it properly, actually confirms biblical history and actually shows up some of those events in history, like the, the wives of, of Noah's sons and the flood of Noah's day and going back to Noah. It's, that's just absolutely fascinating. So we'll see you again for part seven and part eight.